Hi, Jason. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely, man. Okay. So I want to tee this up like this because I think this will launch right into your overall philosophy for health, for wellness, for, for longevity. I'm watching a, an interview with, I think it was Lewis Howes and Dr. Jordan Peterson. And Lewis asks him a very simple question. He says, you know, what are like five points of advice that you would give for being a better person, to making life easier, whatever the case may be. Number one, and this is why I think you're going to love this. Number one, he said, physical fitness so that you can walk through this life with greater ease. So from that, tell me what you think about that and how your philosophy plays into that, that very thing. And then just take it anywhere you want, PD. Um, well, sure. Well, uh, naturally, I agree. Physical fitness is very important. Health, you know, if you want to expand that expression to health overall. So yes, health and fitness, very important. Um, it totally affects your outlook on life. Um, and of course, gives you the ability to do what you want physically. Um, I think maybe a, a very uh, underrated aspect of being in good health and having good physical fitness is the effect on mental health. Um, this, this is something I've talked about a little bit on Twitter. Um, in and I would say that most people don't really see the connection. I mean, I, you know, the idea, for example, that if somebody is depressed and, you know, then they uh, start taking medication for it. Um, now, you know, I'm not saying that, um, you know, that is, might not be necessary in some cases, but in fact, a lot of things, um, a lot of things affect our mental health. A lot of, you know, our physical fitness affects our mental health. <clears throat> the brain is an organ like every other organ. It's sitting in our body and it has, you know, health or ill health. And so if you can be in good health, then that definitely affects your mental health. Um, the conditions of modern life are such that we, um, we don't live in an environment the kind of evolutionary environment that you know human beings are used to. We don't go outside much. The food is uh, uh, highly processed and artificial in many ways. Um, we, you know, we are sitting down a lot instead of moving around uh, much. So you know, in in um, in in former times, and I'm talking about a long time ago. Uh, you, you know, say, say before the advent of agriculture 10,000 years ago, um, people would have been eating um, no, no agricultural products or virtually none. And, um, and they would have been active all day. They would have been out in the sunlight. They would have ex been exposed to heat and cold. And these things are all what we're adapted to. So um, <clears throat> the, the general phenomenon um, which describes these, uh, a lot of these exposures that I'm talking about is hormesis. So hormesis is basically uh, a, uh, the process by which a stress leaves the body in better health. So exercise is really the prime example of that. You put a stress on your body, your body recovers and gets uh, get stronger, healthier, faster, uh, better metabolism, all these things. Basically, um, it's a survival mechanism. You know, your body's basically saying, well, um, you know, damn, that mountain lion almost got us that time. So better get stronger and faster so it doesn't happen again. Um, that's what exercise does. But um, there are many other um, stresses that, that, uh, that have similar effects that make the body healthier. Um, for example, heat or a cold exposure. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, these kind of things, even, even maybe a, a, a lesser example, standing. So I'm standing here at my desk, um, 
most people, you know, with with uh, the sedentary jobs that people have and sedentary lifestyle, they're sitting most of the time. Um, so these are all examples of, of hormesis. And I would say that this concept of hormesis is critical in staying healthy, both, both physically healthy and mentally healthy. Um, we, just, we just have um, too much comfort now, nowadays for our health. Um, so we, in, you know, in ancestral times, in the, in the course of human evolution, the, the, the big thing that affected health then were acute diseases and trauma. Right. So, right. Um, you know, if, if somebody, I mean, if you go back, you know, 10,000 years ago or more, um, a broken leg could have easily been a death sentence. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we don't have that problem, at least as much now. Um, also, you know, they, they were dealing with infections. Of course, one of the reasons a broken leg could be a death sentence is because it could get infected. Um, and there, there was nothing much to do about that. Um, so, so acute diseases and, and trauma were the problems, but now we've traded that. Now chronic diseases are the problem. Um, the acute problems we can mostly manage. Um, you know, if I had a broken leg, I have every confidence that I could get fixed up, um, and, you know, by, by the modern healthcare system. If I had pneumonia um, or, you know, or some other kind of infection, I I have every confidence that they, they could fix me up. Um, but now we're faced with chronic diseases, heart disease, cancer, um, dementia, um, you know, diabetes, all these things. And my confidence that modern healthcare is going to fix these things up is far, far less. Um, and, and this largely arises from, well, it partially arises from lack of hormesis from our from our too great a comfort uh, that that we have twenty four seven, and the food we're eating, of course, and and other factors, lack of sunlight and so on. Um, but so we we have traded the environment in which acute diseases could cause us acute diseases and trauma could cause us great harm, but chronic diseases were rare to non-existent for an environment in which we can now handle those acute problems. But now the population is rife with chronic disease. I think that is so perfect, man, because like I, and you, and you made me feel a lot uh, smarter than I actually am because I just wrote an article on how, dangerous how hazardous our current habitat is as as a, as an evolu evolutionary thought we were not made for this habitat and one of the things that really triggered it i'm sitting watching uh i get i was watching a football game and an arby's commercial comes on and so i've got like a thousand calories you know in, in, with like god knows what other toxins and chemicals injected into it to preserve it on my screen that basically says get up for just a few seconds, go to the garage, sit in your car, drive in your air conditioned car to Arby's and the slaughter has been done. It's, it's presented before you. There's no exertion of energy. And so one of the things that I wrote in this particular article was that one, exactly echoing what you said, we were not made for this Uber abundant habitat. It's great. The 10 cent calorie is a modern miracle and it's fed a lot of people and, and that's, it's good. But also we have traded one hazard for another. You mentioned it. Uh, we, whereas we used to have to leave the cave and worry about the saber-toothed tiger getting us on the way to gather the food. And then we had to drag the food back. We had to quarter the food. We, had to, we exerted all of this energy just to feed. Now it's the opposite. There's so much of the abundance that that has become the hazard. And you know the, the thing is, PD, that what I'm learning uh, and this is just a recent, um, a recent protocol that I've started. And I want you to touch on this because one of the things I love about what you teach and what you're in your writings, uh, which I encourage, I'm going to put in the show notes, all of the books you've written. Uh, so is this idea that most people, they have this idea, well, I don't work out. I don't exercise. Well, 
you know, again, going back to our ancestors, they didn't leave the cave probably and do push-ups and, and pull-ups. They actually did survive. They had to survive. They had to lift things. They had to sprint to run away from harm. They had to do these things. And so what I've started doing now, I still do my regularly scheduled workouts, whether it's resistance training or cardio, but then also like right down below me, below this office, I have a chin up bar, I have where I work out. I work out in my garage, right? I will have a goal to do at least a hundred pull-ups throughout the day, not at once, but when you and I finish this conversation, I'm going to go downstairs. I'm going to knock out five kettlebell swings, 10 pull-ups. And then later on in the day, I will do 10 more pull-ups and, and just just mark them off. Or whenever I'm on a walk, I will sprint three or four times during that walk. So talk to this listener that now most of the people that are listening to this podcast, they probably have some sort of uh, uh, exercise routine or workout protocol. But then there's also a lot of people that listen to this podcast, because I've got guys like you that are smart and are experts on this, to tell them that how they get started and to start to we hear ancestral living. It's a cool buzzword, but I think you did a beautiful job of articulating the difference between where we came from and where we are. But the thing is, our amygdala and our makeup and all, it didn't change. It's still built for being out in the wild. So how can people start to incorporate this mindset into their everyday lives without some soul crushing, you know, workout every day that they think that it's just as steady. It's just trying to earn your calories. Talk a little bit about some of the habits that you've deployed and things that you're, you're, I know you, you coach people. What do you tell them to do to get started? Um, well, okay. There, yeah, there's a lot there uh, to talk about. Um, for one thing, um, I would say that um, most, most people's idea of exercise um, is let, let's say um, suboptimal. Um, so for example, uh, walking now walking, I totally encourage, I walk myself daily, um, and, and all this kind of thing. This is, this is one thing it's difficult to critique exercise because any kind of exercise is better than nothing. Right. right? Yep. So definitely if you're walking by all means, anybody who's, who's hearing this, keep, keep walking. Um, but the thing is it's suboptimal. So you, you need strength training as well. This, this is really important. Um, the, what happens as we, as, as we human beings age is we lose muscle, we lose muscle mass. And so this can be detected in, in people as early as age 30. And then it accelerates with each passing decade. So that by the time someone is quite old, say 80 years old, they can have lost fully half the muscle mass that they had when they were say 20. So strength training is very important. It's, it's important for men and women. It's important for young and old. Um, there is nothing really that is going to improve your metabolic health better than doing strength training. So this is something that I believe is really underappreciated. Um, you know, most people don't, don't consider it. Uh, most, uh, you know, doctors don't really talk about it. Like, hey, you know, they, they'll say, hey, you should go out walking every day, but they don't say you should be doing strength training. So the second part to that is, so I'm, I'm sure many people, uh, you know, the average American probably when they hear the, the, the expression strength training or, or weightlifting, resistance training, all referring to basically the same thing. They, they're, they're like, oh my God, I, you know, those things are heavy. I don't want to do that. Um, and furthermore, um, you know, you, you know, you Mangan, you talking about building muscle and so on, but I can't spend um, an hour a day in the gym, five days a week. I don't, don't have the time for that. The fact is it doesn't take that at all. So for example, I, I currently work out less than one hour a week doing strength training. Yeah. So my, my, I work out twice a week and my workouts currently, I time them every time, but they take me under 25 minutes each. Um, I should say that uh, they're pretty intense workouts. They're, they're difficult. Um, and when, you know, while I, I guess I could say that I enjoy doing them in a certain sense of the word enjoy, um, I'm, I'm usually glad when I'm done with it. 
Um, so but PD, uh, PD, real quick, real quick. I want you to talk to, I mean, you'll probably get to this anyway, but I want to make sure talk to the listener about some of the advantages to that high intensity workout. Why? And because a lot of them are saying, wait, wait a minute, I'm on my Peloton for 60 minutes every day. I mean, I was that guy that was just doing a ton of cardio. I mean, I've always done some sort of resistance training, but I think you're, you're on something that talk about the science and what you're, what the benefits you're yielding in that efficient short. Yes. Tough as hell you know, hit workout, but the benefits for the mitochondria and all that, what actual benefits you're getting from that? Right. So, um, for one thing, so I, I, I lift weights. I've got a barbell, dumbbells, and a chin-up bar in my garage. That's how I'm doing it now. Used to go to the gym, but due to the uh, unfortunate recent events, my, my gym went bankrupt. And so I'm at home now for the last year and a half. Um, so, um, so I'm lifting weights in a form of training called high intensity training. And what this refers to uh, in, in the simplest terms, it means that, that in any given exercise, let, let's say a barbell curl. For those who don't know, it's you take a barbell and you lift it like that as an exercise for the biceps. <clears throat> you're going to, you're going to do, do that form um, relatively small. Always in good, can't emphasize that enough. No, no, it always smooth, controlled motion, no swinging anything around. And you're going to do that until you can't do it anymore, until you cannot move that weight or resistance that you're using. That is, that is known as going to momentary muscular failure. That is high intensity weight training. What this does, it's, it's, a, it's a great, uh, in addition to strengthening your muscles, it's a great cardiovascular workout too. So I regularly, clock my uh, my heart rate what in the middle of my workouts between 150 and 160 and uh, you know according to I, I take it with a grain of salt but according to things I've read at my age my that's supposedly getting very close to my maximum heart rate how old are you um, PD 66 dude that's amazing I mean that that's that that's high for you know for a 25 30 year old man that's <laughs> crushing it man awesome right so so you get this great cardiovascular workout. Uh, and by the way, just as an aside, heart rate isn't everything. The, 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 the heart um, also varies in the amount of blood it pumps with each beat. So, you know, just looking strictly at heart rate is, um, doesn't give the whole picture, but I'll just leave that to side. That, that, that's a complete different discussion. But in any case, so, Yes, it benefits the mitochondria. It benefits metabolic health. So one of the things, um, so as you may know, um, diabetes is rampant in this country. Approximately something like 10 to 12% of the population are diabetics. Um, a number of them don't even know it. And the thing is, is that diabetes is only maybe I shouldn't say only, but diabetes is the end result of a long train of metabolic ill health. And um, most, uh, most Americans are on that train. So they won't all, all get there eventually, but they, most Americans, one, one recent study showed that 88% of Americans had some degree of metabolic ill health. And so one of the one of the main defects in that metabolic ill health is that uh, muscle doesn't take up glucose as well. Um, mus muscle gets uh, lipid uh, in it, and so th in, and this is this is a prime defect in diabetes and in metabolic syndrome. So by doing strength training, you are effectively working against that. Um, the, the amount of muscle that people have, and again, whether it's men or women, young or old, is a, is a very strong determinant of metabolic health. And so if, if anybody's wondering about, you know, I, I, I say metabolic health, and, and when I say this, say, for example, on Twitter, you know, people ask me, well, what do you mean metabolic health? It just, it just means the ability to process energy um, in in um, many um, 
I guess you, you could look at it as insulin sensitivity. That is a huge part of, of it. So insulin is a hormone that rises when we eat uh, and goes down when we're fasting. Um, so, you know, that's all, that's all normal. It's supposed to go up when you eat and, and drop when you're fasting. But in many people, it goes up and pretty much stays up or it doesn't drop back down nearly enough. This is known as insulin resistance. And most people have some degree or another of insulin resistance. So this is, this is a main determinant of metabolic health. And by doing strength training, you are, you are fighting against that, improving the metabolism of the muscle, which is a big deal. The other uh, side of that story is body fat. Um, so um, by, by doing strength training, you're going to uh, increase your, uh, improve your body composition, and um, which means increasing the amount of muscle you have, decreasing the amount of body fat you have. And so uh, uh, um, I will say, I'm talking about strength training here, but diet is of course a very big determinant of your level of body fat. Um, exercise, including strength training, has all kinds of uh, you know, health benefits. Um, unfortunately, weight loss, it, exercise is not terribly effective on its own right. for weight loss, you gotta get the diet right. So, right. But, but definitely, uh, you know, strength training and other exercise is, is just crucial for good health. And excuse me, let me just uh, turn this thing off here. Yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, I apologize. My phone has been ringing during this. Okay. Hey man, it's it's it's, li it's a live podcast, brother. So no no worries at all. Okay. Well, tell me. So we've talked a little bit about what your actual workout protocol is, the hit training, and I'm sure I'm sure you blew a lot of people's mind whenever they not only did they hear the the efficiency of the individual workout, but also just the the amount of time you work out in any given week. And when people hear that, you know, I was reading uh, the Immunity Code by uh, Joel Green. He says the same thing. He works out once a week. It's intense and it's, it's, you know, he, he's going to get the most out of it, but it's very efficient. So what is your eating protocol? Because you mentioned diet and people are going to be like, all right, they've heard paleo, they've heard keto, all of these different things. And as it relates to insulin resistance, again, you're talking my language. And I'll tell you another thing too, that, you know, when we're talking about type two, so I've got my youngest daughter has type one diabetes. And so that the listener knows there is a difference type one you don't have any choice. It happens. Type two, what you said, it is generally a, a, a series over a lifetime of bad eating decisions, but it can be curtailed. And if you have type two diabetes, it can be at least, I guess the, the, the jury's still out on whether it can be completely reversed, but there are some things you can do to dramatically, uh, increase your insulin sensitivity. So I know that this is one of the things that you write about, you speak about. So talk to the listener about what that eating pro protocol looks like for you. Oh, okay. I, um, I, I would just, uh, you know, comment on what you said uh, about reversing type two diabetes. Um, it's, it's, it definitely does happen. Um, it, interesting, uh, Doctor in the UK, Dr. Roy Taylor has has studied this in great detail, and he's found that he can put diabetics into remission in as little as a week wow. uh, with a very low calorie diet. Um, this this gets more complicated, of course, because how long can one sustain a very low calorie diet? Um, so, as far as insulin, the the, the other thing, you know, my the direction I go in, my my preferred uh, method, if you want to call it, of of dealing with type two diabetes is low carbohydrate. So um, eating carbohydrates in large amounts, especially refined carbohydrates and sugar, is very much related to insulin sensitivity. Um, and uh, there are a number of studies that have shown that people eating low carbohydrate diets. Um, can reverse their diabetes. There's even a company right now, Verta Health, that is uh, does telemedicine with um, with type two diabetics, and they they are able to reverse diabetes in most of them over the course of months to a year. I think it depends on how 
probably on how diligent someone is in sticking to it. As far as what I do, so I, I do eat low carb, uh, you know, occasional carbs creep in, but, um, you know, mostly, let, let's just say most days is, it's close to zero carbs for me. Um, and um, a big thing, I stay away from ultra processed foods. So this is the single thing um, when I, when I try to tell people about how to get in better health, if, if I had just like one, if, if I could only say one sentence to, to people, I'd say, don't eat ultra processed foods. So what are ultra processed foods? These are the foods that are, well, first of all, all foods are processed. That's why we have to use the word ultra processed. So unless, unless you're picking an apple from a tree and eating it, everything you eat is processed in some way or another. But also processed food takes it to another level. It's factory food. It's the stuff that comes in boxes and bags and bottles and cans sold in the middle aisles of the supermarket, comes with colorful labels, brand names, heavily advertised. That's what they want you to buy. This stuff is poison. This, I, I think a case could be made that I mean, it, 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 that it's the single biggest factor in our epidemic of chronic disease that we see. Um, so that so that's one thing. I don't eat ultra processed food. Um, that's important. I eat real whole foods. The real whole foods, that's the stuff that's sold on the perimeter of the supermarket. You meat, fish, eggs, dairy, fruits, vegetables. Um, so that's what I eat. And I also make sure I get adequate protein. And uh, that's another thing that's very much missing in, in um, you know, for most people in what they eat, they don't get enough protein. The RDA for protein is set ridiculous, ridiculously low, in my opinion. Um, and, and many people are not even getting that much. So, um, so I guess, uh, it, you know, in a nutshell, I'm eating low carb, relatively high protein, real whole foods. And, and, and then um, that along with my weightlifting, my strength training, that forms basically the, you know, the two legs of how I keep healthy. What about intermittent fasting? Uh, yes, I do intermittent fasting. And what's your um, protocol look like? So um, my, uh, intermittent fasting, um, you know, I might go 16 hours fasting. I don't do that every day. And, and, and these days I do it less so than, than I used to, but I, I still do it. So uh, yeah, intermittent fasting is important. Um, it, it, uh, it leads to longer life. There's a really interesting uh, study that came out recently. Um, so it's been known for a long time now, since about 1930, that calorie restriction extends lifespan. So this, this was discovered, you know, uh, the scientist Clive McKay was, you know, he had his lab rats and everything back in 1930. And he decided, you know, to see what would happen if he fed them less than they wanted. And to his great surprise, they lived a lot longer and they were a lot healthier. Yeah. And, and so ever since then, th this, uh, the calorie restriction has been um, studied over and over again, duplicated, uh, duplicated, not the right word, but it's been repeated many, many times. And um, it is the single most effective intervention for life extension in lab animals. Um, and it works basically across the board from worms and flies up to rats to primates and so on. So it, this re, more recent study has found that um, basically the detail is when uh, scientists are studying calorie restriction in, you know, in animals, um, some lab assistant comes in once a day to feed the animals and they eat their food all at once because they're so hungry. And then guess what? They're fasting for the next 24 hours. Uh, mm -hmm. And so lately it's been wondered, well, gee, Hmm, maybe it isn't calorie restriction after all. Maybe it's because they're fasting. And that is indeed what they're finding out that, that really it seems that calorie restriction 
is is really just another form of intermittent fasting and that yeah. that is what is producing the lifespan extension yeah and i think that a lot of it from what i'm reading is you know just from a very a very lay person's uh look at this is it's kind of, it goes back to on the outside the environment on the outside we we do better when we actually have to exert physical energy in mental physical whatever to acquire that which we eat if our body is so stuffed and so full and so crowded with all the crap, then it will, it's kind of like one of the things, and I want to get into supplementation because I know that you, you've got some great advice on supplements, but you know, when we overdo it with the things that our body can naturally make, the things that you can get from food sources, the things that you can get from actual activity, if eventually your body will just go, okay, you got this, then we're out. And it, and it will kind of just sit. And I think that's what happens internally. And, and with the, temporary starvation which essentially is what the way your body's going to read it then it's going to kick in other devices for survival and then and that's one of the things that pd i think i have tried to really uh, communicate with folks is that we were made first and foremost for survival you know and if you if you will feed those elements of the body that were created to survive and you will hone those, then you will do indeed survive longer. And you will like to what you, what you write about and what you you're constantly looking at and putting out that longevity. It's not just about living longer, but it's about living well longer. Uh, So I think that's one of the things. And that's for me, you know, a lot of people hear intermittent fasting and they go, Oh, it's all about the calorie restriction. It's, it's just eating less. No, it's it's letting your body rest. It's your digestive system rest. Let your gut heal. Let the cell, if you can get to a point of autophagy, let your cells clean up. Right. Uh, it, there's just so much more to it. Uh, one of the things that let's just dive into. Where did this journey begin for you? Because I know that from from the research I've done, there was kind of a transition where you were awakened to this, like so many other people, like like with the weight training. You know, it's not just for meatheads; it's just for people that want to be healthy. So, kind of talk to where this whole journey began for you. Well, okay, um, yes, th- th- it's definitely been a journey. Um, I've been interested in health and fitness for a long time you know let let's say in 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 my own health and fitness for a long time let you know let's say since age 20 or something like that um and you know i so i i was exercising i tried to eat right according to what i knew at the time um i got very much into running later so in the 1970s uh the running craze began and i tried running and i thought well okay well i'm gonna do this i like it so i i did and um, I ran nearly daily for must, you know, must have been over 20 years. Um, and I've, I've run a couple of marathons in my life. Um, and then anyway, along that way, um, I was very concerned with, um, with being healthy in general, but also with heart disease. So when I grew up, um, there was a lot of concern about heart attacks, um, more more so than there is now, I would say. Um, And by that, I mean, we're talking about the phenomenon of middle-aged men clutching their chest and falling over dead. Um, I'm not talking about necessarily heart disease in older people, chronic conditions, and of course that's a problem, but not exactly the same thing. This uh, uh, heart disease, this heart attack epidemic, if you want to call it that, rose tremendously in the 20th century. So, you know, around 1920 or so, cardiologists hadn't even heard of heart attacks. Um, they, they were doing other things. They never saw them in, in their practice, but then they started happening and getting more and more, and, and they just rose exponentially in, in the 20th century. Famously, President Eisenhower had a heart attack in 1955. And then this, this reached a crescendo about 1965 just a huge big deal. Anyway, my father had heart disease. And uh, fortunately, you know, it didn't fell him in that way. He ended up living to a pretty ripe old age. But um, he he had this problem. And I could see that it affected him very much. And not just physically, but also mentally. I mean, I can't even imagine what it would be like if you, you know, if you think every day, well, you might have a heart attack and drop dead. Um, I mean, I can remember him 
um, going, uh, you know, like, hey, hang on a second, I got to pop a nitroglycerin, you know, because he had chest pain. Anyway, so I, I, I decided, no, that's not going to happen to me, um, or I'm going to do what I can. So I followed, you know, the mainstream science, and the mainstream science said, don't eat saturated fat, don't eat a lot of meat, because that, you know, that will clog your arteries. So that's what I did. I eventually became a vegetarian, and and eventually, I'm sorry to say now, kind of embarrassed to say now, I, a vegan. So there I was doing my long distance running and being a vegan. I, I did okay for a while, but eventually I became ill and uh, eventually got a diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome. So uh, I saw a lot of different doctors. Nobody could help me. Uh, I did find one doctor who ultimately did help me some. Um, but eventually I decided that if I was ever going to get over this, I, I had chronic fatigue syndrome for 11 years. If I, I decided that if I were ever going to get over this, I had to figure it out myself uh, and, or at least try. So I did try. And um, so I just dived right in and figured a few things out right away. Uh, the first thing I figured out was that being a vegan or vegetarian was uh, probably not the best thing to do. Um, and so eventually I started feeling better and then I um, started lifting weights. Yeah, that was very hard at the beginning. I had done it previously in my life, but, it, but this next time that I did it, it had been a long time since I had done it. It was very difficult. I was on the cusp of kind of getting over my fatigue, but I kept at it. And um, after, after a month, let's say of, of doing that a few times a week, I decided, wow, I need bigger weights. So I joined a gym and never looked back. Um, so that's, that's how, how I did that. That's how I got on this path somewhere uh, along that way when I had chronic fatigue and I was finding out a lot of things. I just, I, I thought to myself, if I ever get over this, I'm going to have to write a book about it, or I should write a book about it or something. I've never written a book before. And, and then when I was healthier, then, then I, I thought, that, oh, yeah, you know, I was going to write about this. So, OK, so I'll write about it. So I wrote my first book about chronic fatigue syndrome. <clears throat> and then after that, um, I thought, well, OK, what now? Well, I guess I'll write another book. So I just kept going and going. And then um, more recent in more recent years, I've been a lot more active on Twitter. I have a website, of course, and so on. But so that's how I got where I am now in, okay. in terms of being a health and fitness influencer, if you want to call me that, um, and, and how I got into how I improved my own health. Now talk a little bit about chronic fatigue, like for the listener out there, how do you identify it and what is actually going on? Is it like, does it have to do with your mitochondrial health or your, or your what's, what's happening with in, in whenever you are diagnosed with the chronic fatigue? Yeah, that that that's a really tough one um, because <clears throat> fatigue it, in itself is um, it seems to be the number one thing that people go to their doctors to complain about. So fatigue can be caused by so many things. I mean, it it could be anything from you're not getting enough sleep to you've got cancer, you know? So if you go to a doctor and say, I'm tired all the time, well, he's got to do a pretty thorough workup, you know, and figure it out. There are some, you know, obvious um, tests to be done like thyroid, right? So hypothyroidism leads to fatigue. It's a very common autoimmune disease. And, and you know, so a number of tests like that. Chronic fatigue syndrome <clears throat> is basically what they call a diagnosis of exclusion, like they basically, they can't figure it out, you know? So, so this was the case with me. They run all the tests, they examine you from top to bottom, all this kind of stuff. And then they still don't know why you're tired. At that point, um, somebody could give you a diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome. So what is going on there? Again, a lot of, a lot of theories, um, there's a scientist by and, and doctor by the name of Michael Mize, M M A E S, who's done a lot of very good work, and and his <clears throat> his writings influenced me a lot in 
thinking about how to overcome it and what was going on there and so on. Um, you know, there's ideas like <clears throat> leaky gut syndrome leading to autoimmune problems. Um, yes, mitochondrial dysfunction. There's another doctor, uh, Sarah Myhill in the UK, who's done a lot of work in this area. So, you know, what's going on? I think it would be difficult to say, you know, to pinpoint something specific in all cases. It, it seems to be a very sort of general malaise. Uh, Dr. Mize has compared it to what he calls, um, what is called sickness behavior. So sickness behavior is exactly what it sounds like. When you're sick, you just want to lie down and you're tired and you, you know, don't want to move. This is, this is adaptive, right? Your body's telling you, Hey, you know, you need a rest here. You need a break. So don't, don't overdo it. Just just lay down until it goes away. That's sickness behavior. So um, there are correlates between sickness behavior and chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, so, you know, if you if you dive into the medical literature on chronic fatigue syndrome, you come up with all kinds of different theories and um, and possible treatments. One thing that chronic fatigue syndrome definitely is not is all in your head. Mm -hmm. And this is this has been a, a standard answer from many doctors for many years. You know, when they can't find, when they do all those tests and examine you thoroughly and they can't find anything wrong with you, then the answer becomes, oh, well, it's all in your head. And um, I wouldn't want to say that's absolutely never the case, but I think that that's a, a very, um, condescending and uh, attitude towards the people that have it, that are going through real problems. Many people have chronic fatigue syndrome way worse than I had it. Uh, um, <clears throat> I, I was on disability for a short while, but I thought, but I realized this is not going to work, you know, sitting around, sitting around the house all day long. So I was fortunately able to go back to work and I stayed working. I was able to walk a little bit. That's, that's how I kept up my activity. Some people are, you know, confined to bed uh, many, many hours a day, just basically can hardly move. It, it's bad. Um, so it's, and it, it, it's not in their head. Wow. 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 It's, and what a, what a drastic change you've made. I mean, that's, that's pretty phenomenal, man. And, and, uh, honor you for that 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 is phenomenal now let's get into a little bit about supplementation because <clears throat> one of the first things that i one of the first things i discovered about you was in my research on rapamycin and i was because i'm looking at you know reading david sinclair's work and peter Tia's work and uh joel green a lot of these guys that really kind of touch on if not like david sinclair focused specifically on longevity and some of the supplements that have been used for other things but now are, we're seeing benefits in this space what supplements and I, I okay specifically for longevity and my uh so i just spent two days with my mom and dad in Boulder, Colorado, visiting my youngest daughter. First time I've been around them for that long in a while. And my dad is someone who always had great health, you know, exercised, you know, very regularly, but due to, you know, a hip replacement and, you know, he's got macular degeneration. So he has no central vision. There's just, and having to take care of my mom who suffered a stroke two years ago that we're just lucky she's even here. There's just been a lot of things. And so being around him, I'm sitting here, I, I can see just signs of inflammation and, and things like that. If you, if he came to you and said, you know, he's a client, you signed him up, you know, what are some things both we've talked about some of the, the physical things that we need to do for longevity, but as it relates to supplementation and, and, and feel free to touch on rapamycin. I know it's been controversial in some in some studies as to whether it should be used because there are some side effects with regard to going back to what you're talking about, insulin resistance and that sort of thing that it can it can hamper. But it's almost like well, it's kind of like the outlying, you know, thing. Yeah, it could happen. But talk about some of the supplementation that you that you that you are a proponent for and some of the things that maybe you disagree with that people are talking about for longevity. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So, um, just, just to, um, touch on a couple of 
what you might call everyday supplements or, or things that most people could uh, benefit from, um, are, a couple are magnesium and vitamin D. So magnesium is very, very important. And um, unfortunately, there's not as much magnesium in the food supply as there was say 50 years ago um, due to agricultural practices, food processing and so on. Um, and also uh, apparently uh, a, a pretty good source of magnesium that people used to get a long time ago was hard water. And nobody's drinking that anymore uh, or very few anyway. <clears throat> so. And then there, uh, you know, like I was saying, processed food doesn't have as much. Certain things like drinking alcohol, drinking coffee or tea um, can cause you to waste magnesium, to excrete it more than normal. So um, most people could use magnesium, in my estimation. Vitamin D is another one. Um, <clears throat> so vitamin D is, is the vitamin that we get that, that is manufactured in our skin when it's exposed to sunlight. Um, <clears throat> people have been told, here, you know, here's another thing right here with one of my problems with mainstream healthcare is because everybody for the last three, four decades has been told to stay out of the sun because it'll give you skin cancer. So as a result, we've got many, many people who are vitamin D deficient, and that leads to much worse problems than possibly getting skin cancer. Um, so uh, vitamin D is another one that most people could use and, you know, and or regular sun exposure uh, to get vitamin D. Um, the, whole, the, the whole area of anti-aging um, supplements or drugs is a fascinating one to me. Um, I, I studied it pretty closely. So um, rapamycin. Rapamycin is... Um, <clears throat> Uh, is a drug that is used in transplant patients. And um, my, my friend, uh, Dr. Mikhail Blagoskloni, who's been probably the main advocate of, of rapamycin, has said that it's unfortunate that when rapamycin first came out, and it is an FDA-approved drug, that it was labeled in it as an immunosuppressant, um, because now that's how people think of it. Um, and does it really suppress immune function? Well, yeah, in a certain sense, but in, in healthy older people, there's been a trial where they gave them small doses of rapamycin and their immune function improved. Um, so rapamycin has been shown to extend lifespan and health span in uh, many different animals. Um, and and <clears throat> um, so this, this seems like a solid candidate for uh, an anti-aging drug in terms of side effects. So this is, this is interesting. Um, this gets a little into the weeds, but it's fascinating to me. So one of the, one of the alleged side effects of rapamycin is um, higher blood glucose, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, typically if somebody has higher blood glucose, they think of this as, well, this is diabetes. So you, you can see references in scientific literature to, you know, one of the side effects of rapamycin is getting diabetes. And so of course, why would anyone want that? Um, but the fact is, is this, there's an interesting analogy. There's something known as starvation or fasting diabetes. So what this is, is if somebody like, say you were to stop eating right now, and then um, you did this for three days, and then uh, at the end of three days, 72 hours, you ate a bunch of carbs. <clears throat> you would, um, glucose would appear in the urine. You'd have high blood sugar. This is fasting or starvation diabetes. And this has been known a long time, like 150 years probably. Um, so this is an analogy. This appears to be what's happening with rapamycin. Rapamycin has been called fasting in a pill. Uh -huh. um, and so what it's doing, um, <clears throat> you know, molecularly is it's disconnecting various things. Um, so they, they can have somebody who's taking rapamycin could have higher blood sugars, not necessarily super high or anything, but higher blood sugars. But at the same time, insulin is very low. So this is this is what happens 
in fasting or starvation, diabetes, when you fast for three days, your insulin gets very, very low. You become basically keto adapted. Your, your body's running on ketones. And then all of a sudden you eat a lot of carbs. Your body's not used to it. And you know it appears at least briefly like you've become diabetic because, because that's what happens. Your body's adapted to, to uh, not eating. And then the same thing happens um, you know, if, if somebody who's been on a very low carbohydrate ketogenic diet for a certain length of time, and then they eat a bunch of carbs, it could spike their blood sugar, maybe even glucose appear in the urine and so on. So this appears to be what's going on with rapamycin. Um, some people, <clears throat> some people have said, well, you know, we need a lot more study with rapamycin, um, you know, before, uh, we can advocate that humans, take it. Um, but the fact is, it is an FDA approved drug. It's been taken by humans for, I think, well over 20 years. Um, and it has a uh, low rate of adverse side effects. Uh, Dr. Blagoscloni, in one of his papers, he cites uh, someone who tried to commit suicide by taking 108 milligrams of rapamycin and nothing happened. Um, so this is, this is like, um, that would be like about 108 times the daily, daily dose. Um, so, so there's, there's that the other, the other aspect of, you know, waiting around for human studies and so on is, <clears throat> um, by the time anybody, you know, the FDA, for example, gets around to approving it for what people want it for, um, you could be dead. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, what, what are you going to do? You know, uh, going to wait around. So um, another one that another promising anti-aging drug is metformin. Um, mm -hmm. Peter and David Sinclair talk a lot about this. So uh, metformin is also a very safe drug. Not only that, it is dirt cheap. Um, probably uh, other than aspirin, it, it's just about the cheapest drug around. Um, so like, like five cents a tablet or something. So, um, this is an anti-diabetic drug. It's been, it's been used safely for several decades in the United States and around the world. And, and it does extend lifespan in mice. Um, it doesn't appear to be as powerful as rapamycin in, in to, to that extent. Um, interestingly about both of these drugs is that, um, this can be seen, especially with metformin, because it is literally an anti-diabetic drug that it is counteracting, counteract, you know, if used conventionally, it's counteracting diabetes. But then you also say, oh, it extends lifespan. So what does that mean? It means poor met metabolic health predisposes toward a shorter lifespan. And that good metabolic health with low insulin and low blood sugars means you're going to live long in good health. It's really fundamental. Yeah. yeah. It remains to be seen, of course, if somebody is, is in good shape, in good health, exercises, eats right, would they be also benefit from metformin in terms of lifespan? Well, we don't know. Um, there are some indications in scientific literature that they would, and I base that statement on the results of uh, animal, animal experiments. Um, for example, um, you know, if it, if it extends the life of silkworms, which it does, it's, uh, it's hard to argue that silkworms have a poor lifestyle and, and therefore, you know, met, metformin is helping them. Right. Um, you know, they just, they just eat mulberry leaves, you know, that's it. Uh, so anyway, um, as far as, um, as far as other drugs or supplements, so one that gets talked about a lot is nicotinamide riboside. So NR. So this is a derivative of vitamin B3. Uh, and um, my, my take on the matter is I am less than impressed um, by, by the results. So again, when you look at what does nicotinamide riboside do, it increases levels of NAD+. What also increases levels of NAD plus? Well, a ketogenic diet does, and exercise does. So this is this is to some extent, um, you know, counteracting lifestyle. It could be argued, of course, that aging in itself, you know, does lead to these things like um, you know worse metabolic health. Although, in my opinion, 
um, <clears throat> aging itself is much less of a determinant, um, lifestyle much more so. There, there's an interesting um, study where they looked at insulin sensitivity between older uh, and uh, an older group and a younger group. And they so they did all these measurements and everything. And they found out, yes, indeed, the older group had worse insulin sensitivity or, or more insulin resistance. But they also found that when they adjusted their data for waist circumference or visceral fat, then the difference almost disappeared. Really? So, yeah. So in other words, it's a common idea that older people have um, more, more in, greater insulin resistance, but a lot of this appears to be due just because older people put on body fat, lose muscle, and are, are, are not as in good a shape. So the obvious um, corollary is, well, if you stay in good shape, that's not going to happen. So anyway, nicotine or my riboside, it seems you know, in my, uh, you know, interested amateur opinion, it, it just seems less than impressive. Also, there does seem to be evidence that just taking plain old vitamin B3 will do virtually the same thing. Um, there seems to be, um, from my observations, there, there, is, there are a lot of people out there they're looking for the holy grail and they're looking to make it to, for a startup company that's going to make them a lot of money. Hey, I can help, you know, I can help you live 20 years longer or whatever. Obviously that's going to make a lot of money. Yeah. People are, you know, so um, the, the things that will improve our health span and lifespan are the, the best, the best known things are here already. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's get, it's getting in shape. It's not eating crap food. And, and then if you want to go further, rapamycin and metformin are available. And so this life extension and health, ex health span extension is here now. Yeah. Um, you, you don't have to wait for a startup company, um, you know, to, to do this. So anyway, that's, that's my take on nicotinamide riboside. I mean, the main manufacturer of NR has all these scientists on its board, you know, and, uh, and I mean, obviously everybody wants to make money. I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I guess I can't knock them for that. I'm, I'm just pointing out that a lot of the focus on NR seems to be driven by that as far as I can tell. And, and also the development of other anti-aging drugs or practices. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you touch on something that it's it's real easy to get cynical really quickly because we we're so focused on you know which came first, the chicken or the the egg. Well, it looks to me like if if the chicken is age and cancer is the egg, then I don't know if I'm, I'm using a good analogy, but the bottom line is if we would start treating aging more like a disease that can that that can if, that if treated properly can prevent some of those diseases that show up in later life we would be much better off but you just said and it was just like we, you said earlier it's not sexy to say okay you're you're you had your vitamin d deficient go stand in the sun for five freaking minutes you know you're right. stressed out go go practice some mindfulness go for a run when it, if you're if you're feeling the fatigue and your and your your metabolic health is is not what you want it to be on your walk do three sprints you know don't pull a hammy get yourself ready uh now uh the uh the russian uh doctor that you uh, pronounce his last name for uh, me, right? dr blagoskloni dr blagoskloni does say it right okay he has a great opinion paper on rapamycin that i read in and it is fantastic and i'm going to actually include it on the in the show notes because he gives a lot of the detail of and again it's a it's an opinion paper but he takes rapamycin like every day right i mean and he's probably He's weekly. older than you. He's in his seventies, right? Okay, takes uh, weekly. He, he's actually younger than me. He's, he's is about he? six. He's about sixty. Yeah. Okay, I don't know why. I, I just assumed that. I guess, but he, uh, he's. Uh, I think he's got some really good data that hopefully people will start taking a look at. Same going back to David Sinclair and Metformin. That's where when I was reading his book uh, Lifespan: Why We Age and, and Why We Don't Have to. That's the first I had ever heard of. And of metformin used as anything other than a, a drug to treat diabetes. 
Uh, so, but yeah, these things aren't sexy. They're not big money makers. You know, right. you know, you and I, you and I will stay out of the uh, controversial waters of what of 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 other things that are going on that there's treatments for that may be that n- nobody gets to make money off of. So. We don't get to talk about them as it relates to viruses and that sort of thing and whatever. It, I think there's a lot of that. So, but I think that what you you can you can just kind of sum up what you said there with you know what look there are treatments that aren't crazy expensive that it's just deciding to take control of your life and your health that again will make you live longer, live healthier, and and. Going all the way back to where this started, it's interesting. You followed the exact same path that Dr. Peterson did in that conversation. He said that he started talking about how physical exercise was the number one recommendation. And then as it relates to mental acuity, he said everyone, and even Tom Brady, who I think is the greatest quarterback that ever lived, you know, he does his, his brain games every day. That's part of his daily deal. But Jordan Peterson said those have shown no impact on cognitive ability to do those like those kind of puzzles or whatever he said exercise shows time and time again to help your mental capacity so bringing that back to where we are in this conversation to going back to like my dad giving him advice or you know you you always i do think reading is push-ups for your brain absolutely but all these folks that are if they're not doing the physical exercise, but they think that just doing reading or memorizing poems is going to keep them from getting Alzheimer's or dementia. No, you have got to do the physical exercise, right? Yeah, absolutely. Correct. Uh, Alzheimer's has been called type three diabetes. Yeah. Uh, There's all kinds of evidence that's related to, you know, uh, poor glucose metabolism and, and lots of other things. Um, you know, similar things, basically poor metabolic health. So, you know, absolutely. You, you, like I said earlier, your brain is an organ in your body, just like any other organ and to keep it healthy, you got to do the things for it that are healthy for the rest of your body, like good food and exercise. Um, so yeah, a- absolutely. Um, you, you've, I mean, keep keeping up like reading, for example, you know, certainly, certainly seems useful. Like when, when I'm not, when I get away from reading, uh, uh, complicated, uh, long books, I find like, oh, maybe, you know, my vocabulary is deteriorating or something like that. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's practice. Right. Um, but yeah, really to, to have good, good brain health and good mental health. Absolutely. You need to exercise and eat right. Well, and I think one of the things too, to sum up for the listener that we just keep talking about over and over and over throughout this conversation is managing your glucose levels, managing your, managing your blood sugar. Obviously, like I said earlier, having a type one diabetic as a daughter, you really start to learn the importance of it, but then you go all the way back to what, you know, Dr. Michael Eads, who wrote the book protein power, who's been on this program a number of times. That's what his deal was. He was hammering way back when manage your glucose levels and you know my wife thinks i'm crazy but i want to start wearing a continuous glucose monitor just at least for a month or something just to see the impact that foods are having i think if people would focus on these simple things that are not that complicated and make it part of their daily habits that um, we go a lot further but you know, PD, this has been awesome, man. I am so grateful for this uh, this conversation and for you sharing your wisdom. Tell people where they can find you, uh, anything you've got coming up. If you've got a new book coming out, I want you this, you know, how can people learn more from the work that you're doing? Well, thanks a lot, Jason. That very flattering. Um, so um, these days, my main venue is really Twitter. So they can find me on Twitter. My handle is Mangan150. And uh, I also have a website, roguehealthandfitness.com. Great name, um, by the way. I don't know how you pulled that off, dude, but, we're, but getting Rogue in there, that was awesome. Well done. <laughs> Thanks. I don't know. It just popped into my head and I thought, oh, that sounds pretty good. It's so, awesome. Love it. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> And then let's see. So yes, I've got several books for sale on Amazon, uh, and I coach clients. You can see my pin tweet if you go if, if you're if someone's interested in coaching. Uh, see my pin tweet on Twitter. Uh, let's see. I just wrote wrote a paper that I'm very uh, um, proud to say was published in the scientific journal Aging, um, and so you can uh, that's in my Twitter feed somewhere. You can find that. 
and um, that's where they can find me. Fantastic. And then one thing that has nothing to do with this conversation, but I see Napoleon over your shoulder. I just, <laughs> I just look, check this out. I finally just decided to dive into the, the Napoleon's biography, phenomenal uh, uh, historical figure. And so, uh, so cool. That's again, has nothing to do with this conversation, but I just couldn't help but notice uh, Napoleon over your shoulder. I, I love that. I love the painting is uh, Jacques Louis David. And uh, it, it just, you know, it, it, it means to me, it means overcoming obstacles. Absolutely. Napoleon crossing the Alps. Yeah. Absolutely. I love it. All right. Well, sit tight. I'm going to do a little sign off here and I'll come say bye properly very shortly. Folks, if you didn't gain some wisdom and some knowledge from that conversation that I don't know, maybe I need to hang it up. PD, thank you so much. And for those of you who are either listening on the podcast, if you're just listening, thank you so very much. I do have an ask. If you would please go out to iTunes and rate the show, give us a five-star rating. That really, really helps. And also, if you're watching on the YouTube channel, if you just happen to stumble upon this, please click subscribe and check back for clips, videos, helpful hints, the things that I'm doing. I would be grateful. And then also, finally, please subscribe to the Vitruvian Letter. This is where I I show I showcase all the little things I'm trying to do to improve always in always and achieve perfect balance emotionally, spiritually, physically, nutritionally. I will never reach that perfect balance. That doesn't mean I'm going to stop trying. So with that, PD, thank you so much for coming on and thank you for listening. And again, remember, try, endeavor to improve always in always. I'm Jason Wright and I'm out.